All right, let's get started. Hello, and welcome to this session, FSI 310, on Fannie Mae's workload migration to AWS at scale. Like many financial services institutions, uh, Fannie Mae is also undertaking large-scale digital transformation to further their mission and to accelerate their uh, infrastructure modernization on AWS. To help customers in this journey, AWS Cloud Adoption Framework, also called CAF, uh, helps customers uh, by providing guidance in six perspectives. And these are business, people, governance, platform, security, and operations. In this session, you will hear how Fannie Mae has incorporated these different perspectives in their own journey to AWS. I'm Harsh Anipani. I'm an AWS Solutions Architect. And joining me on stage are two speakers from Fannie Mae who are uh, leading their transformation uh, journey. The CIO of Fannie Mae, Mr. Aman Richards, and the VP of Lender and Service for Technology, Mr. Satya Dagarla. Here is the agenda for the session today. This session is divided into three parts. Ramon will walk you through Fannie Mae's uh, cloud strategy, the mission statement, and the digital transformation objectives, followed by Satya, who will dive deep into the cloud strategy and the cloud migration journey. And then followed by, in the final segment, I will walk you through the uh, technical patterns that they have adopted uh, to enable workload migrations at scale. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Roman. Great, thank you, Harsh. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first, for many of you, I know it's been four or five days in Vegas. So first, thank you all for joining us on a Thursday afternoon. Um, I know Vegas, after four or five days, can, can take a little bit out of you. So I'm really happy to be here today. And I'm going to start off, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just, a, just a brief overview on Fannie Mae for those of you less familiar with our business. So. Fannie Mae, um, we support the secondary mortgage market. So uh, we do not originate loans like your typical lender, but what we do is we um, will acquire these loans and we'll acquire these loans and issue mortgage-related securities in exchange. Fannie Mae's focus, our vision, is to be America's most valued housing partner. Our mission is to facilitate equitable and sustainable access to home ownership and quality affordable rental housing across America. Today, 65% of home ownership, today there's 65% home ownership in the United States. And, you know, that percentage, the reason for that large percentage uh, is tied to the liquidity that Fannie Mae provides to the market. So when we take, um, for example, uh, in 2020, Fannie Mae provided $1.4 trillion in liquidity to the market, which translated in us, to us helping finance one, one in every four homes in the United States. So I want to shift now, um, before we get into our discussion about the cloud journey, and talk a little bit about our digital transformation that's underway. So, we have this visual that we've created that kind of summarizes our, our digital transformation uh, in one page. So digital, our digital transformation program, it is foundational uh, to the future of the company. It is important to us being able to continue to serve and deliver on our mission uh, to support homeowners and renters. Three main objectives that are part of our digital transformation. One, uh, we're driving operational efficiency that allows us to deliver more business capabilities. Second, we're focused on increasing speed for our business and for our customers. And third, we're focused on improving our platform stability, security, and resiliency. With three, three objectives, uh, we feel this will position us well for the future to continue to serve our mission. Now, you know, our digital transformation is, is about a lot of change. It's about change in terms of how we operate uh, from a people perspective. It's about 
re-engineering, redesigning our business processes and driving more automation. It's about a new technology, new digital capabilities that will enable um, our business and allow us to deliver new innovative products for our, our customers. But behind all of the things that we're doing, one of the most important parts of our digital transformation is our cloud program. Our cloud program is a key enabler for uh, everything that we're trying to do as a part of a digital transformation. Moving to cloud, leveraging cloud native services will position us well as we move forward. So, um, like us now to kind of dig into our cloud journey. And I'm gonna hand it over to Satya uh, to talk more. Thank you. Thank you, Raman. Again, so my name is Satya Adagarla. I lead the single family technology and also enterprise cloud migration. I'm happy to be here to share our journey over the last two and a half years. Uh, like Raman mentioned, cloud migration is an underpinnings for our digital transformation. So I'm, um, you can see you know, the benefits, what we envision um, through this cloud migration, but I wanted to touch upon one thing in, in this uh, six segments here. Um, often you would see you know, time to market, business innovation, and those, but one of the key things we kind of contemplated was organizing for effectiveness. It is not about just organizing for driving speed to the cloud, but also operating on the cloud such that um, we get the full benefit of migrating to the cloud. So in terms of bringing your um, DevSecOps together so that a body of work when it comes from a product management team to a technology team, it starts and finishes at the same squad. I think it reduces the interaction with other squads so that they can fully uh, maintain the speed. I think that's the, that's the key I want to touch upon this. Um, next, to give you a, a, a dimension around what exactly is the size and complexity of the migration we were, we were embarking on. You can see we have about 11,000 servers. May they be um, standalone servers or VMware servers. We have roughly 2,500 applications. When I say applications, there are um, different types in there, right? One is, uh, you know, the, the pure applications that you see, but at the same time, we also have a bunch of utilities that are cards products. Um, we also have end-user computing. So all that is part of the cloud migration. And then from the, to give a, a dimension of complexity of the technologies, ranging from TIBCO, BW, COBOL to all the way, you know, C++ and Java. So you can see the spectrum of the types of applications that are, that are in our ecosystem. So that kind of sets the, the um, magnitude of the body of work we are, we are embarking on. So before we even get into the, the cloud strategy, how are we going to take the applications one way or the other, we have, uh, we have established some guardrails which are very important to us. So along the journey, we want to make sure that we are maintaining these. So I will touch upon a few of these, like for example, when I, when I look at um, minimizing the technical debt, right? So as we are migrating to the cloud, we may have to make calls to take some of the legacy technology into the cloud so that we maintain the speed, because it depends on the complexity of the application set we have. So, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we are getting to a place where there is minimum technical debt. So it is striking the balance towards getting to the target state of using the cloud native technologies to, hey, is there a body of work that is going to be slowing us down? Would it be better if we take some of those technologies into the cloud? So we had to maintain a balance on that. Um, one other one I want to touch upon here is that the enterprise operating model, right? So we have gone through a, so Fannie Mae has been a, an agile shop for the last five years. However, this one, um, we had to look at it very carefully such that the interactions with the application team to all the enabling teams, like your cloud COEs, like your um, data teams, like your infosec teams. Um, we had to come up with an operating model. It is much more simpler and leaner, such that the interactions are happening very timely. So some of these guardrails are there. At the same time, I also want to touch upon some of the measurements we want to be um, keeping. The top one is this, right? 
percentage of workloads operating in the cloud. And there is a lot packed into that one metric. Um, so in essence, if you are taking any application to the cloud, I think it counts as a plus. However, you also have to decommission or retire the applications that are on-prem. On so if you haven't done that, then it is going to be, the metric is not going to be progressing well. In addition to that, you know, this journey is going to be like anywhere between three to five years, depending on the size of the, size of the work. Um, along the way, you will be building a lot of new applications. So we want to make sure that applications are built from this point onwards only on the cloud. So all these three things encompassing that metric. And at the same time, we also want to make sure that once we are on the other side of the migration, we are managing good flow metrics, like the Dora metrics here. So you can see you know, the lead time. We have a target towards starting a body of work to deployment within 30 days. So that's our, that's our goal. So we have these measurements um, to, to measure our progress along the way. And also, once we are on the other side, are we reaping the benefits of the cloud migration? So we have both types of metrics packed in here. Um, when it comes to the, the cloud strategy, needless to say that our primary focus is um, getting to AWS cloud. At the same time, we have pockets of places we have used different um, technologies, like, for example, O365. Um, we use Azure for that. And when we look at our entire footprint, we have some of the cards products that we are using on-prem. So when we go into the cloud, we can make a choice, right? We can take this as is and move, or you find a SaaS version of those alternatives such that you move towards that. Our preference has been moving toward, towards the SaaS versions. So, and once we have decided majority of the applications are going to go to AWS, we have gone through a six-hour strategy to disposition our apps so that we have clarity around what app is going to be in what type of pattern. So you can see, you know, refactor. This is nothing new here in terms of, you know, refactor, replatform, repurchase. Um, I think I wanted to tease out the nuance when we talk about refactor. So often people think that, you know, you take an application, you modify a bunch of code and improve it a little bit, that's what is refactoring. But in our case, um, it is also thinking about reimagining the business process and then building that to the, to the target state business process. That is what we call as refactor. In the replatform, not only just switching out your um, on-prem technology to cloud-native technologies, along the way, if you were to improve upon some of the, some of the code, we actually did that. While a lot of people think that that is a, that is a refactoring, it is actually a replatform for us. So we can clearly see where the business process changing versus where it is not, so that we have a mechanism to test them pretty well. Um, there is a, there is a rehost um, option here that we have tried. I will talk about that a little bit more as, as I progress through the slides. Um, I'm going to share our journey and also some of the learnings in these four dimensions, right? On, on the technology side, what things have we done um, and what we learned, and along the way, how we progressed that through. The second one is operating model. We have, um, we had to go through certain gyrations to, to improve upon and stabilize the operating model to, to sustain a reasonable amount of speed. So I'll talk about that. Change management, right? When we look at in the context of digital transformation, we are not just talking about you know, upskilling the people who are migrating the, migrating the applications to the cloud, but the rest of the entire um, application developer community we want to be able to bring them to a place where they can continue to operate within the cloud. So I will talk about um, how we, what techniques have we used to you know, upskill the people. Uh, then the last one is you know, governance, especially we being in the financial services industry, highly regulated. So um, from NIST controls to FedRAMP controls, SOCs, um, how did we take this entire process? We call it as path to production a lightweight governance that kind of allows people to move through very swiftly, but yet we have all the artifacts that are necessary to manage our compliance. So first, um, on the technology side, um, as you are starting the migration, I think we took an approach of 
identifying some MVPs. So we identified about six MVPs, minimum viable products, that kind of scans our entire spectrum of the applications to tease out different types of complexity, whether it is mainframe, whether it is SOX, or is it a um, modern, recently built web application, or database heavy. So we kind of went through these, these dimensions to say, these are the six MVPs we are going to run through to understand a few things. One is end-to-end -end body of work. Are there things that we are missing that we need to have in place such that once we are in the cloud, it is much more useful to us? So we had to run through this. I think the biggest aha moment for us is that as we are going through, we had to rethink our security posture in terms of you know, the, the cross-site scripting versus you know, the container images have been um, are we downloading the right images? Are we allowing people to download other images? So we had to work through all that. So that is a, that is a huge learning. And then uh, as we go through the, the MVPs, we also kind of saw that you know, 2,500 applications and we have about you know, 260 plus teams, agile teams. For each of those teams to come and do the migration, there was a lot of upskilling in a very quick manner. So we kind of quickly identified that, hey, there are gaps in terms of our ta cloud native talent. So we changed the operating model to dedicated bandwidth from the portfolio. So we roughly used about 26 squads um, for application migrations. These 26 squads are going to be just migrating application over application over application. So as soon as they migrated, the, the, pro the portfolio teams can take that and run with that. And I'll talk about how we have achieved that in our operating model. And then, then we, when we look at the um, entire set of applications, we've been um, using AWS since 2016 in a very small focused way. We had to look at the scale of it. So the multi-account structure has been a, a big um, focus where we had to take some more time and think through whatever has been there today versus what it needs to be. So our primary principle have been, has been you know, the, the, the cohesive data plane and then distribute, uh, sorry, cohesive uh, control plane and distributed data plane, such that it gives a lot of freedom for folks to do their body of work within their domains and their, their line of businesses. Yet it gives also the, for the cloud COE folks to see what exactly happening on, on the control plane. Um, we also had a mechanism to see the delivery process and what improvements to be made. So we have a, a value stream analysis team. This is um, a, a group of uh, process engineering folks who kind of looked at our initial delivery process. And then they identified a few things to improve. Right? There are certain things that we had to parallelize stuff so that we can um, drive speed. And there are certain places where we saw, hey, as we are migrating to the cloud, it was taking almost five to six weeks to just set up the initial environment. So that was a huge opportunity. So we had to go through a few accelerators that we built within the company. So when the architects create our uh, MVA, uh, minimum viable architecture, they're not just writing you know, a Word documents. They actually create all the resources needed in a YAML file, and even that has been automated. And that YAML file is going to be read by another tool that we created called Flash, which will set automatically their pipeline as well as their instantiation of all the resources that have been identified during the architecture. So this kind of compressed that entire first day environment built from five to six weeks to one to two days at max. So that kind of gave you know, a lot of, uh, lot of speed. In addition to that, we also looked at a few technology stacks that we have been using, and some of them are very legacy. So there are parts of the, the organization has been using technologies like Ab Initio, and they have heavy stored procs in Oracle databases. So we had to take a pause and see, hey, what if we allowed these into the, into the cloud? So that is where earlier I talked about the, the technical debt. But we had to take a very close look at our security posture. We had to go through um, an effort to create micro-segmentation so that the transitional architecture, as we are migrating, it is still maintained with, with a good security posture. So that is a, that is a huge learning. The, the last one I would say, um, 
providing freedom for developers so that they can do things much more faster. So for example, um, we have provided uh, Docker desktop um, so that they can actually build on their own laptops versus going to a, a development environment on the cloud. So these are the types of things um, we kind of learn in this, uh, in this technology segment. The next one is operating model. I think this is, when you, when you look at the left-hand side, you kind of see the, the standard Agile squad model. But our thinking is it has to be um, within six to eight people, eight or nine people within the squad. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the interactions with enabler teams are very simple, so they are at the release train level. The one point I want to touch upon is that as these um, squads are migrating applications, how are, the, how are the application teams are going to be managing once it is being migrated? So we kind of had two people from the application team from the portfolio join this um, Agile squad such that during the migration, they get to see what changes have been made and then how it has been um, replatformed so that once the application migration is done, these two people go back to their portfolios and they manage the work and any enhancements they have to do from that point onwards. On the right-hand side, our philosophy has been when we look at the governance, this is purely the execution governance. We do not want to let any issue unaddressed in, in, the, in the five days. So every week, we should be able to look at all these 26 squads and see what issues need to be resolved and where we need to step in and help the teams. So in general, I think we have daily um, scrums, and then we also have daily scrum or scrums, and then we call it as S3, which we run once a week, where I share that with my, with my colleagues from um, cloud COE, infrastructure, architecture, and then InfoSec folks, so that any issue that comes within that week, that will be looked at, and then that will be dispositioned, and we'll, we'll generate the action. I think this is one of the effective ways we were able to um, get the migration moving faster. Um, the change management. So this is not specifically for the cloud migration, right? This is under the context of digital transformation. So while these 25 squads are 26 squads doing the migration, we also have rest of the, the developer community. We wanted to get them to a place they are going to be operating within the cloud. So we went through a, a three-step process. First one is just baseline what is the full stack engineering skill sets are needed for us. And then from along the, along the dimensions of the breadth and also the depth, because we have different levels of engineers within the, within the organization. Um, then we ask the, the engineers to self-assess them. And we also ask the, the managers to um, do their assessment so that we, have, uh, we understand the gap, what that is. And then the managers actually talk to the employees around um, their development action plan. So that sets the training plan for them. I think that is, that is the second body of work. And then the third body of work, this approach is just by training them, it is just 10% of the game. That means it gets you to be aware of how it works. And then we took two other steps. One is that the, you know, pair them up with some senior developers who have had a lot of experience in the cloud, cloud uh, technologies. So they get to work with them along the side. So that we call it as exposure. Then afterwards, we find, as soon as they get through that phase, we find them and place them in places where they can actually use their skill set. So that means within the portfolios, now they are accelerating to use the cloud in every enhancement they're trying to, trying to make in their portfolios. So this is the, the governance model. So we call it as path to production. Um, we have four um, high-level checkpoints in here, phase gates here, right? The first one is for ideation and then, hey, is this something we even want to do? So the, all the due diligence goes along with it in terms of, hey, what is the value prop? And then uh, who is sponsoring it? How do we feel about, you know, when, when is this going to be um, delivered? And then when, how much value are we going to reap? All that is being taken care in terms of the permit to launch, the first phase. Most of the, most of the folks participate there are actually product folks with, uh, with uh, all the executives with uh, line of business as well as technology. Then the second phase is you know, permit to plan. This is where, hey, for this particular use case to go to production, 
Is it one team or is it multiple teams that are going to be participating? That This is a mechanism to communicate to all those teams so that we can line them up. The majority of the time is spent in the, in the last um, two segments. One is uh, permit to design and build and permit to operate. This is where most of our technology teams are spending their time. Um, in this, we have all the non-functional requirements along the way, they have been automated such that the developers don't have to create evidence for anything. So through the logs, through the DevOps pipelines, we, we gather the evidence such that that is being stored and that can be utilized for tracing back if you were to. So this is initially when we were going through this, and even this has been developed in an, in an iterative fashion, right? So the first two quarters, it took um, teams to fully understand and adjust, but at the same time, until it has been fully um, automated, they didn't see this as a, hey, this is a lightweight governance, it is actually going to help us. But by the time we get to the third phase, now people started seeing. So it is extremely important to, to drive the message in the organization, hey, this is going to be helping you with the speed. It is just not a governance function that is not going to be impeding. I think that's, that's the key message, that's the key learning for us. So just to, this, is a, this is an eye chart here, just to give you guys um, the bodies of work um, the, the, the five different bodies of work that are going in parallel in delivering any of our capabilities or any of our applications. And just to give you guys a sense, the architecture and infosec, the DevOps teams, the, the data and governance teams, the cloud COE, and the application migration teams, all of them have got parallel activities that are going on such that you know, the, the whole set of applications can be migrated during this time. Uh, here I'm going to be, so at this point in time, by end of this year, um, we will be around 49 to 51% on the cloud, operating on the cloud. And so far, I'll just give you a few anecdotes around, hey, what is the business value that has been realized through this migration? So you guys have seen the, the COVID hit um, last March timeframe. Um, we had to respond to the market very quickly. May it be, um, you know, forbearance-related work, or some of the places where the market actually hasn't moved at all in terms of, you know, buying the homes. Reason being, folks were not able to allow the, the appraisers into their homes. So we had to put together solutions very quickly within two to three weeks, and then bring it, bring it to the market such that the mortgage market again starts moving, and then people are getting their loans and things like that. Um, I will also touch upon another one, which was, uh, um, as, as a byproduct of this, during this COVID, we also had got lowest interest rates. So it was a paradox. People didn't know how to get the loan. At the same time, the interest rates are low, so the people wanting to do a lot of refi. So our volume has significantly increased almost three times um, per day. So we, we were able to easily scale and then be able to process through these loans, even if it is 3x volume. So this was only possible through having this type of elastic cloud for us. So just to uh, give some of these, I think you guys can uh, see there are a few other um, examples, but uh, as I'm running through the clock here, so I wanted to touch upon the few important ones. Um, so this is the one I'm going to leave you guys with. So this entire migration is going to take three to five years. Right, so it depends on the size of your migration. But during these five, five years, your business strategy is not going to be constant. It is going to be evolving. So it is extremely important to think through what decisions should we make that are completely mutable. That, that means if you change them, there is going to be a huge setback. You are going back in a year almost. Right? Um, when I look at the multi-account strategies, the networking, the, the, the VPC setups, the security posture, these are the types of things that come into the immutable bucket. Then the second one I call it as defend. That means, yeah, you can change, the, you can change your decision along the way. However, there is going to be implication maybe three to six months. That means either additional work or un peeling the work back. So the things like if you wanted to change your resiliency posture, if you wanted to um, look at the, the transitional architectures uh, security posture, suppose 
as you are migrating, I, I think we have a situation where there are 32 applications that are dependent on certain databases, and you can't move all the 32 applications at once for various different reasons, because they are from different lines of businesses, the teams may not be ready, or they have different priorities. Um, in those cases, we had to break them apart. So we had to create some transitional architectures. Um, those are the types of things that you can look at and say, it might take, if you were to make decisions differently, it might take additional work for a quarter or two. And then the last one is discussed. This one is allow flexibility. Let the teams kind of experiment and then kind of move from that point onwards. Today you have glue, tomorrow you have talent. So be able to use them, right? So we have looked at the decisions in these three different um, buckets so that even if there are, you know, business, um, our business strategy changes and you want to make more investments on there, this actually allows the flexibility for you so that you can um, either accelerate or kind of slow down, depends on your business strategy. So we had to be very carefully uh, thinking through these types of things. So at this point in time, I'm going to invite Harsha to dive deep into some of these um, technologies and the decisions that we have made and then how they have been executed within, within our ecosystem. With that. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Satya. Let me double click into the three tier God, decision cool. strategy that Satya spoke about. There's something we call one way door decision and two way door decision. A one way door decision is, like Satya mentioned, it's immutable, it's hard to change. So I'm going to be talking about uh, those immutable decisions from a technology perspective. Security and resiliency, as you heard from both uh, Satya and Rahman, and yesterday from their chief operating officer, Kimberly, who mentioned about risk management for Fannie Mae. Uh, these are, the resiliency and security are very, very important for both Fannie Mae and AWS. These technical patterns that I'm discussing are the bedrock of architecture best practices that Fannie Mae has adopted and um, in their AWS environment. So let me start uh, from the bottom uh, portion, which is their multi-account strategy. Satya touched on that a little bit. A well-architected multi-account strategy helps you innovate faster and uh, also, it, it allows you to create a structure where it will give you flexible security controls to apply for different use cases and different uh, um, applications based on their risk posture. And it is easily adaptable in, 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 as you, again, as Satya has mentioned about you know, evolving business strategy. What you're seeing on the screen on the left side is a foundational organizational units, which are immutable, which is uh, your security, your infrastructure, like networking, et cetera. These are the accounts, these are organizational units that you create in your multi-account strategy, where you're gonna be running your security tooling, your centralized log archive, et cetera. And then shared services like you know, Active Directory and other you know, application monitoring tools, things like that. On the right side are basically your workload accounts uh, Fannie Mae has adopted a combination of both business unit-specific lifecycle accounts and also product-specific lifecycle accounts. Um, and I'm going to touch on why that's important. So uh, here are the key takeaways from a multi-account strategy perspective. As I was telling you, AWS accounts for Fannie Mae are segmented by business function and lifecycle. And then crown jewel applications are segmented into separate lifecycle accounts or product-specific accounts. You may ask why product-specific accounts for uh, Crown Jewel applications. And the main reason for that is, first of all, security posture. You can apply service control policies uh, directly on OU level and then, then control access based on uh, the importance of those applications. And also to essentially allow it to uh, rate limit. You don't want to be running into service quota issues and things like that for your Crown Jewel applications, and that's why uh, they have adopted a uh, product-specific ones. Next up is, with respect to provisioning of multiple AWS accounts, what Fannie Mae has done in the uh, initial iteration is built a in-house um, uh, provisioning model. So uh, from the time a request is made to provision a new account to the time it's uh, delivered, it's all in-house built scripts. Or if you were, uh, the easiest way uh, to set up if you are starting today 
would be to leverage AWS Control Tower, which will allow you to uh, set up a multi-account AWS environment um, automatically. It creates, there are three elements to Control Tower. One is called Landing Zone. Landing Zone is basically a uh, AWS environment that is um, created using Control Tower, which uses blueprints. Um, and these blueprints are organizational policies and uh, integration with IAM, um, single sign-on, and things like that. And then there is a second element called Account Factory, which is essentially uh, creating multiple AWS accounts using a pre-approved network configuration. So once you're done with the AWS multi-account strategy, the next most important thing is how are you going to connect your data center to AWS? Fannie Mae uses AWS Direct Connect, which enables you to um, create a, a consistent, low latency, high bandwidth network connection between uh, your data center and AWS. And uh, their network architecture has evolved over time. In the, as Satya was mentioned, this journey started in 2016, and now it has evolved uh, throughout these years. Initially, their connectivity, we call that north-south traffic. North-south is from AWS to data center, and then east-west traffic is VPC to VPC. In the initial iteration, what Fannie did is uh, they used something called private WIFs um, of Direct Connect uh, as for north-south traffic, and then VPC peering for uh, VPC to VPC communication. But the problem with that was, as they started scaling, managing of those network connections and VPC peering became a significant overhead, and that's when they transitioned to this new architecture, which is basically Direct Connect Gateway and Transit Gateway. Um, and this became a, a hub and spoke model. So let me double click into the actual implementation of Transit Gateway by Fannie. So as you, uh, as you can imagine, there are multiple accounts, multiple lifecycle accounts. Uh, you don't want development to talk to production. You don't want, but however, you want all these different environmental accounts to be able to talk to shared services, VPC, and things like that. So there is a lot of complexity from a security perspective and from governance perspective. And the way to do that is use your transit gateway as a hub and spoke model where all VPCs are attached to the transit gateway. Um, and that is both for east-west traffic and north-south traffic. And going into uh, further details, so a VPC, uh, the, all the VPCs are connected as a VPC attachment to Transit Gateway, and then your on-prem routers, the customer gateway is also connected uh, through Direct Connect Gateway to Transit Gateway. And now, many of your uh, setups uh, typically have a DMZ layer. Right? Uh, you have to interact with the uh, internet. In the data centers, you would typically have a two-layer DMZ, an inner DMZ and an outer DMZ. Inner DMZ is for egress and outer DMZ for ingress. That is exactly what uh, Fannie Mae is working on is, as, as, as part of their cloud strategy is have those different ingress and egress layers, and that is what you are seeing with these outbound VPC and inbound VPC. Uh, the idea there is Anything egressing out needs to be filtered through an external proxy so that you know, only proxy aware applications can be filtered uh, and you are doing URL filtering and applying DLP protections like data, lake, uh, data uh, exfiltration and things like that. And for ingress, you want to provide, especially because this is coming from internet, uh, you have to mitigate DDoS attempts and malicious actor attempts, et cetera. So in order to do that, one of the common patterns that they use is a CloudFront distribution as a front-end layer, and then align that CloudFront distribution with a uh, application load balancer layer where you can apply web application firewall rules uh, to block um, uh, bad behavior, right? In addition to that, there is another regulatory requirements. Again, uh, Satya spoke about SOX controls and FedRAMP controls. One of the controls is to monitor the activity between AWS environment and their data center, and that is why on the right side you have this inline service VPC which scans the activity between their AWS environment and their um, on-prem environment. So let me double click a little bit into that inspection VPC on the right side, that inline services. The way these uh, inline VPC, the inspection VPC works is you essentially have a separate VPC uh, where uh, it is attached to the transit gateway just like any other VPC. However, all the traffic that is coming from your workload VPC going to on-prem is redirected to a special scanning VPC where a security scanning appliance is stored. The, the cool thing about this design is uh, gateway load balancer endpoints are a routable um, target, and what, what you can do with that is 
you don't have to worry about what if your security firewall appliances uh, you know, are having a problem in an availability zone. You don't have to manually worry about uh, adjusting the routes and things like that. The gateway load balancer will take care of it. And you can use the, one, the important thing when you're uh, implementing a solution like this is the transit gateway attachment to gateway load balancer, you need to allow transit gateway as a, uh, in an appliance mode uh, to avoid asymmetric routing to the uh, gateway load balancer bagged uh, firewalls. And the reason why that is important is there, if you look at the architecture on the right side, there are two different availability zones. What if one of the availability zones goes offline and you are still continuing to scan your uh, traffic uh, you, that could result in asymmetric routing. To avoid that asymmetric routing, you need to enable uh, transit gateway appliance mode. Next is DNS. So we are done with accounts. We, we got the networking sorted out. Next is DNS. Uh, Fannie Mae, much like many other customers, have a split brain uh, DNS functionality where you have on-prem DNS and you are cloud-based Route 53 DNS. Obviously, these have to talk to each other, um, uh, especially when... Uh, uh, you know, you are sending queries from on-prem to AWS and vice versa. It's done through Route 53 uh, resolver endpoints. That's what you're seeing on the screen here, is uh, for DNS queries that are forwarded to the Fannie Mae uh, corporate DNS, uh, those are done through Route 53 outbound resolver endpoints. And anything come originating from Fannie Mae's internal production fabric going to AWS will be inbound resolver endpoints. And uh, that is the model, that's the architecture that is being used uh, to manage that split brain. And then uh, Satya spoke about VPC architecture. Again, this is very important. Uh, this is uh, something very innovative that Fannie Mae has done. Uh, one of the main challenges with VPC architecture is uh, you cannot modify your primary uh, VPC CIDR block. So what happens is many customers, inadvertently, what they end up doing is uh, they over-provision uh, and underutilize their IP space. Uh, maybe they'll just go start with a slash 16, and then they'll realize they don't really need to use that much. But you cannot modify an existing uh, a primary CIDR of a VPC. Now, what Fannie has done is AWS allows you to create a secondary CIDR block for a VPC. And what they did is to take advantage of that uh, notion of secondary CIDRs and created uh, multiple CIDR blocks, as you can see in each VPC. This is a template that they use for every single VPC provisioning. By doing that, they are preserving their IP addresses. The, the one that you see on the top, the interface subnet, that is the one that is the primary subnet uh, or the CIDR block, and it can be very small. And also, they don't have to guess capacity. They, they allow developers to select the T-shirt size table there on the right side that depicts a, a option developers have to pick and choose what is the uh, compute subnet that they need, et cetera, so that uh, it gives them a modular way to control access and also preserving their IP space. So that's the modular architecture. Next is, so we have the VPC, we got the DNS. Uh, next is the microservices architecture. So, uh, again, as part of the modernization, Fannie Mae uh, is refactoring their monolithic applications to microservices-based pattern. And uh, why, why are they doing that? That's because it's pro providing them with uh, agility, the scaling, and the ease of deployment. And also, uh, developers can use different programming languages to develop these uh, artifacts and still use the containers to deploy. Uh, so for uh, the pattern they are using here is ECS as a container orchestration layer and uh, Fargate for the compute layer. So it's ECS Fargate, but that's also is evolving. They're experimenting with various other technologies, including EKS uh, and the Fargate variant of EKS. So the way this would work is just to walk through quickly the user experience here. A application team may check in their code in a, in a code repo and what happens is as soon as the code repo is checked in, it, it triggers a, a CI-CD uh, process through Jenkins. And that, uh, the whole uh, image is pulled into um, a, a Nexus repo, and they pull the artifacts from Nexus. And then eventually, this, is, this whole image build is completed and pushed to ECR. ECR is the uh, container registry. Uh, where basically, as part of this image push, they scan the images using twist lock. Uh, for any vulnerabilities, and then they address those vulnerabilities. 
Um, and eventually, once that's done, they push these golden uh, container images into Artifactory, JFrog Artifactory, where basically uh, another deployment pipeline comes in and pushes it into the ECS um, uh, clusters. Next is, um, Satya sp spoke about databases and they're moving towards, you know, there, there is a, a, a need to refactor databases as well. So um, the common pattern for OLTP transactional databases is uh, Aurora Postgres compatible database. So one uh, challenge is when you're coming from, let's say, a Oracle database on-prem to Aurora Postgres, there are two things that you need to take into account. One is you need to convert the schema, because these are two different database engines, and then the second component is to replicate the data and get that uh, shipped over. Uh, so they're using a DMS service, database migration service, to do both. Uh, this, uh, the schema conversion tool allows you to convert the database schema, and also it, is, it allows you to uh, load the database and also do a uh, ongoing replication so that you can easily uh, uh, transition into the future state. And the benefits of uh, using DMS here is, first of all, it's an AWS native uh, managed service, so you don't have to worry about managing the replication and things like that. Um, and also, it supports KMS, so you can encrypt all the data that is going moving between your on-prem data center and AWS. Another, uh, again, I'm going to touch on a, a very important thing. So Fannie Mae has an audit compliance to a requirement to monitor database activities. Uh, such as DML operations against the database, uh, and which is very important, right? For a on-prem-based solution, they used to use a database proxy between an application and a database, and the whole point of database proxy was to uh, satisfy the SOX compliance. Um, and they did that, but however, that caused a few issues, like, uh, you know, uh, because it is inline, it is intercepting the transactions, it, it uh, provided performance bottlenecks and also availability issues. It, it, the proxy became a single point of failure in some scenarios. Uh, even though you can architect a resiliency, it still impacted the, um, the performance. So what they have done on AWS is refactored that whole approach uh, by taking advantage of database activity streams Database activity streams, also called DAS, is a offline solution. It is not intercepting the traffic between app and a database. Um, it is, um, uh, once your database transactions are committed to disk, uh, database activity streams will send all those to a uh, Kinesis data stream, as you can see in the middle of the architecture there. And you can read off of those and send it. What they're doing in, in their scenario is redirecting all those database activities to a uh, Kinesis data firehose and from firehose to S3 bucket. By doing that, they can consume all those database activity stream events and integrate that with their uh, on-prem, uh, the enterprise Splunk. Uh, that way the aggregations are still going to Splunk and they're able to meet their regulatory requirements by filtering on those Splunk events. Also, uh, this, uh, this pattern is integrated with uh, uh, there are, in the, at the bottom of the right side, you see other patterns like partner database security, like if you have IBM Guardian or Imperva and other uh, third-party solutions, you can absolutely integrate that with this solution. But what Fannie is doing is uh, the S3 delivery. We spoke about all these refactoring. Now let's dive deep into a little bit about resiliency. How are they meeting their resiliency? What are the next steps that they are taking in order to improve their resiliency? So these are some of these are forward-looking uh, uh, slides. So today, they're already using Aurora Postgres Global DB. Uh, over more than uh, 100 applications are in production are using uh, Aurora PG uh, in the Global DB variant. And the reason for that is it gives them to achieve a low RTO or PO when you're replicating the database uh, across two different regions. It's not just database replication. There are also many other data stores that Fannie Mae uses, like S3 buckets, RDS databases, Dynamo, et cetera. For each of these, instead of uh, trying to do this on their own, they're using the native replication technologies uh, like for DynamoDB, they're taking advantage of global tables. For S3, they're using S3 cross-region replication. There is a feature called RTC, re uh, replication time control, with which they can meet uh, 15 minutes or less RPO for most of these uh, replication events. Next is uh, uh, the 
database recovery uh, or disaster recovery for all these workloads. Like many customers, Fannie Mae has a requirement to have a DR capability on AWS as part of their business continuity planning. One of the DR strategies adopted by them is active standby pattern. There are, for, uh, majority of the production applications are using this pattern. However, there are few that are latency sensitive and uh, RPRTO sensitive that are taking advantage of active active architectures. The next set of slides are going to dive a little bit on uh, these aspects. So you have these applications deployed in multiple um, AWS environments. You are using CI CD to deploy code between two different regions. You are replicating the data between two different regions. How confident are you in order to, uh, you know, to, to make sure you are meeting your RTO, RPO, SLAs? That confidence is, uh, you can gain that confidence by doing chaos testing or chaos engineering on your um, workloads to make sure you are capturing all the failure mode event analysis you're doing for each application and make sure they're meeting your uh, SLAs for RTRPO. Chaos engineering helps teams uh, create real world um, conditions that are need to recover hidden issues, maybe there are performance issues or uh, bottlenecks that you need to uncover and that's what it does. So Fannie Mae is currently testing AWS FIS fault injection service uh, as a a uh, mechanism to uh, you know, tease out some of those fa uh, failure mode analysis for their applications. And you should use FIS to uh, discover an application's uh, weaknesses in order to scale and uh, to make sure there, the, there is observability uh, and also uh, the availability. And the way it works is you create a template for using FIS. And uh, FIS com uh, template contains, basically you're defining a target and you are uh, defining a fault injection action, and then you are uh, creating a stop experiment, right? right? You start experiment and stop experiment. An example of this is many customers may have used auto-scaling groups, right, as a way to mechanism to scale, but how confident are you that the policy that you have defined in your auto-scaling group, like scale at 50% of CPU, et cetera, uh, is actually working, and you have instrumented it correctly. A good way to do that is, as you create these different application stacks, you go to run an experiment and say, try to simulate an availability zone failure or an RDS failure or an EC2 failure. You don't have to uh, you know, uh, wait for an event. You can actually test out a simulated event, and that's what you're seeing on the screen here. Um, and there are some more uh, FIS actions that are, uh, again, it's not just EC2 specific. You can do uh, simulated events on databases, on, uh, on uh, containers, and also um, more on ECS and EKS uh, that are coming up in 2022. All right, so you did the FIS experiments. Now let's look at the bigger picture. At the end of the day, you want confidence that, okay, you did the FIS experiment, you know everything is working fine, but there may be a scenario where you want to run DR testing. And how do you know the disaster recovery, uh, uh, you know, the configuration that you have actually works, right? Instead of waiting for an annual DR event and doing an experiment at that time, there are mechanisms that you can do right now um, uh, to, through which you can um, look at your readiness from a disaster uh, failover preparedness perspective. So uh, you may have heard about AWS uh, services are built using cell-based architectures. You can extend the same framework to your own environment today using a cell. A cell is a collection of components that are grouped in a deployment. What you're seeing on the screen is a cell to the left that is region one and the cell to the right that is region two. And within the cell, you can define multiple subcells that are representative of multiple availability zones, et cetera. So when you create the, the cells through, through application, uh, Route 53 application recovery controller, uh, it gives you insights onto, on, on your readiness with respect to disaster recovery. And that's what you're doing, uh, doing this for. One is the readiness check, and also the second one is um, basically running experiment, I mean, running a, a, a routing control. Um, so once you do the readiness check, you now, if you want to fail over an application from one um, 
one region to another region, all you do is there is a toggle, it's called uh, the routing control, and you're gonna toggle that from one region to another. What happens is basically the whole traffic is rerouted to your DR region. So you can actually do this today. It's, it's like a, a single click button so that you can uh, do this. I would strongly recommend something, doing something like this for very low latency applications that require less than 15 minutes RTO RPO. Uh, this is a very good option for that. Finally, the, big, uh, the last one is, so you did the Route 53 ARC. How do you know if all your applications are you know, uh, meeting those RTO RPO SLAs? This is where uh, AWS uh, Resilience Hub will help you. It's basically, uh, you, can, you can define your application in Resilience Hub. How do you define an application? Is basically, you probably provision an application using a CloudFormation template or uh, a app registry, service, uh, service catalog app registry. Um, if you did something like that, you can use those same templates, CloudFormation templates, to give it to Resilience Hub so that it can auto-detect what is an application stack and then you can define what is the RTO RPO, and, it, and what Resilience Hub does is um, it uses an internal machine learning based assessment to see whether is, is this particular stack following the AWS best practices with respect to resiliency, and then it'll give you recommendations uh, on, on, based on your configuration. For, as an example, if you have, an, if you have a database uh, that is deployed in a single AZ, but you defined a RTO RPO of 15 minutes, it's gonna alarm you that it is not possible for you to do this disaster recovery uh, and, and, and regain within 15 minutes uh, with that uh, setup. So that is an example of how this will work. And the fault injection simulator, the chaos testing that I was talking about earlier, that can be integrated into this one as well. So this becomes your one-stop shop to actually review your DR preparedness uh, and extend your, uh, you know, uh, improve your resiliency. So key technical takeaways. We spoke about uh, how Fannie Mae is using multi-account strategy uh, for rapid innovation, but also consistent security posture. We spoke about how they used uh, uh, built modular VPC design with multiple subnets that gives them great flexibility in terms of, of uh, scaling their applications and their IP space. We spoke about an inspection VPC that gives the, a centralized traffic scanning mechanism, uh, both from east-west, uh, but also north-south traffic. We spoke about hybrid DNS and the need to hybrid DNS. How do you integrate that with Route 53 resolvers? There is uh, application refactoring. The monolithic applications are being broken down into microservices, and they're using container orchestration like ECS and Fargate as a mechanism to do that. We spoke about database refactoring from a uh, Oracle based to a open source Postgres based uh, and how you can do that with the schema conversion tool and database DMS tool for replicating the data. We spoke about forward looking uh, actions that Fannie Mae is taking right now to improve their resiliency posture. One of the things that they are doing is uh, they've already been using Gremlin on, on prem and now uh, experimenting with FIS. And uh, you can use readiness. DR failover readiness through uh, Route 53 application recovery controller, and that's what they are testing right now. And finally, uh, AWS Resilience Hub to help you protect your applications uh, and, and do that failover if need be. So that, those are the key takeaways. Here are some of the resources for you if you're interested to dive deep more into the DR patterns and how these um, uh, architectures are actually supported and if you want to implement these yourself. Um, and that's about it. Uh, thank you, Ramon and Satya, for sharing your thoughts, and thank you all for attending this session. Please complete your session survey. Thank you all. <laughs>